Welcome to the What If Podcast. We're sharing an ever-growing collection of stories from the Belmont entrepreneur community to inspire you to start and keep going. I'm your host, Elizabeth Bortmaker. Here we go. Hey, everybody. We have a special episode this week, and instead of an interview, we'll be sharing a talk given to our Belmont students earlier this semester as part of our Minch Entrepreneurship Lecture Series. Our speaker is Tori Samples, founder and CTO of Leaf Global Fintech. Leaf helps people safely store and transport assets across borders. Currently working in several countries in Africa, Leaf supports refugees and migrants, and they have plans to expand and serve the 2 billion people around the world who do not have access to financial services. Tori Samples is a young entrepreneur with an incredible story. She and I have been serving on the board for the Nashville Social Enterprise Alliance for the past few years, and I've loved watching her develop this idea and bring Leaf to life. In today's episode, she'll she'll share her story as a self-proclaimed, unlikely entrepreneur. She'll present her formal pitch, and she'll share how Belmont's Cone Center for Entrepreneurship is sponsoring 10 refugee artists through her NFT initiative. If you'd like to watch the video version of her slides, please visit belmontetp.com slash what if. And now here's Tori Samples. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you so much for being here. As you can see behind me, um, we, have, we have Live, Laugh, Leaf. That's mostly a joke just because I thought it was funny. But if you talk to entrepreneurs, many of them would probably say, I do a little bit of living, a smaller bit of laughing, and a lot bit of my company. And that's often how I feel. But if I look back over the last four years that I've been working on Leaf and the last 10 years of my life, there has been a lot of life packed into that and a lot of laughter, sometimes laughing at just how ridiculous my life is, and then also a lot of my company. And so I like to call myself the unlikely entrepreneur. This is never the path that I would have expected or chosen for myself, but here I am and I love it, quite honestly. And so we're going to talk a bit about that today. Full disclosure, I am 31 years old. I graduated 10 years ago from Vanderbilt. And so this is also just a nice package that you can see for somebody that's not maybe that far ahead of you, what life can look like, Uh, at least mine. (laughs) I don't think any, anybody is, uh, I don't know if you want to sign up for that, but we'll, uh, we'll share some. So this is, this is what you will see in about 10 minutes on my official pitch. This is what you get of me. I am a data architect by trade. I've worked with refugees in the U.S. for about 15 years, and I worked for HCA, and I have an MBA from Vanderbilt. That's fine. That's a very short snippet, and I'm sure that you've all got great little snippets that you could put on paper as well. Of course, that doesn't share anything about me or how I got here, so we're going to do that in pictures because that's easier for me to put together on a PowerPoint. So this is where I was 10 years ago. A lot of times when I speak to university students, I like to ask them, I like to take bets on what was my undergraduate major. And I'm guessing that in this room, we might actually have a lot of people who understand the connection between music and technology and math and analytics. That's not the case um, outside of Belmont, I would say. I, I never, never get the right answer. But this is where I was 10 years ago. I was a harp performance major at Vanderbilt with a double major in global health. Didn't expect to go into music full time, but I wanted to spend four years studying this thing that I loved. And I can honestly say that that performance degree has set me up to be an entrepreneur every single day since then. The performance skills, knowing how to interact with an audience and engage, being up on stage, all of that is incredibly helpful in business and in, I think, pretty much any other industry. So I graduated. And then my life became this. <laughs> this is a cubicle. If you haven't spent much time in one yet in your life, um, you might do that in the future. And honestly, it's not that bad. I spent six years of my life in and out of this cubicle. And I wanted you to see that because it's important to know that while my life can look very glamorous in this particular moment, a lot of it was spent right here. I've got my Tupperware on my desk for lunch. I've got my assorted items to make it feel a little bit less like an office, but this was my life for a long time. I joined HCA as a data architect. I did not have any technical training when I got that job. It was the recession. I needed a job. I showed up thinking global health, healthcare in the US, I can do this, sure. And I showed up to the interview and they said, 
we're so glad you're here because of your transferable skills from music. And I said, what? And they looked at me and they said, it's an IT job. And I said, no, no, thank you very much. I'm good. I turn on the computer. I turn off the computer. That's it. But thankfully, my, my boss at the time had the foresight to see that connection between the arts and coding. And if you think about it, they're both symbolic languages, music and code. There's a lot of mix of form and structure, but also creativity. And it turned out to be a great fit. It was an incredibly terrible six months of that learning curve, if I'm honest, but I loved it. And I stayed in that for about two years. Then I got really bold and used HCA's personal leave policy to take a six month leave of absence to go work in Tanzania. So my husband and I moved over there and I worked in HIV and AIDS clinics doing reproductive health. And this is another thing that I wanna highlight because this was not something that I knew how to do at the time. I walked in and I mean, I, I got the connections, I got it set up, but I started by sweeping the floor. I, when somebody delivered a baby, I was the one who was cleaning it up, taking the placenta and going and dumping it in the pit latrine because that's what we had. And even the way that they write numbers is different. Just the handwriting style is different. And so I literally started by relearning how to write zero through nine and cleaning because that is so important, at least in my value set, it's important to humble yourself, to start at the bottom, learn from every single person you can. And so from that, I ended up, you know, fast forward, I probably delivered over a thousand HIV tests in a place that has an 11% HIV positivity rate, um, assisted with childbirth and well baby vaccines and, and all sorts of things, was speaking in Swahili to patients all day long and learned a lot from that experience that helped shape my worldview. We also, after that, went and spent three months at a theological study center in Switzerland, um, which is another story, but wonderful. And then I went back, and actually I went back to the same cubicle, but I didn't think you needed two pictures of a cubicle, so this is a lunch with some of my coworkers who were great. Um, and I imagine that if, some of you might know some of these people if you actually zoom in there. But um, then I did another change, I went to business school. I had a colleague that I really, really admired at HCA who just thought differently than anyone I had ever known. And he had gone to business school. He recommended that I do it. I want to clarify, I had never taken a business class in my life. So all of you are probably better set up than I was going into Vanderbilt's MBA program. And I looked, I looked at programs all across the country, decided ultimately to stay in my own backyard, to go back to Vanderbilt because of the opportunities that it afforded me. Um, and so continued to work part-time for HCA while I did the full-time MBA program. Would not necessarily recommend that, but my life began to look a little bit different. Um, did a lot of pitch competitions, all sorts of fun things that you get to do during MBA programs. And then for my internship, that's a big part of the MBA program, I interned in a hospital at Centennial Hospital just across the street. And again, Worked mostly in the ER, did a lot of, you know, patient interactions, making sure that people had pillows and helping people to clean. Again, these things are so important in shaping who, who you are as a person. And so I can only recommend putting yourself out there, learning from everyone, um, and giving yourself a diverse set of experiences. So up until this point, my life looks pretty normal. You know, I've done the Tanzania thing. I've music, tech, whatever. There's, there's a lot going on there but within the realm of normalcy. Um, then I went back to my second year of my MBA program after interning at the hospital, and my life started to look a little bit different. I started working on this idea that eventually became LEAF with my co-founder. We started pitching it around. So just at, we started at Vanderbilt, we went to Denver Startup Week, and all of a sudden we started attracting some attention. We'll get into LEAF, so I'm not gonna spoil that too much yet, but it was interesting to see what we could do as students because we had time and we had the resources of the university behind us. And so we started to, to work on this concept. I did a lot of this, a lot of brainstorming, a lot of figuring out how this thing could actually work in addition to my studies and my work at HCA. And then my life started to look really different. And this is me in Rwanda um, wearing a lot of patterns and feeling like a boss running things from my phone. And ultimately, Elizabeth already mentioned, we work in East Africa, Rwanda, Uganda, and Kenya. 
and I started travel. So I, I graduated from my MBA program, decided to go with Leaf full time, and I worked from home in Nashville for a year, but I was constantly on the road. We did more pitch competitions. I pitched in at South by Southwest and won awards there, uh, won awards at the Vatican in places like Norway, Berlin, Colombia, Kenya, um, the UK, I mean, all sorts of places. I was all over the world and ultimately decided that, well, that is a lot of fun. Uh, it's a great way to blow through money. And we needed to focus on the operations on the ground. And so I moved to Rwanda. This is actually in a refugee camp in Congo a few years ago. But my husband and I moved our lives over there, really committed to this. And then over the course of the last few years, I've become somebody who thinks the, the idea of a vacation is a six-hour motorcycle ride through Congo. So that is where we are today. I, I share all of this to give you context so that when we talk about my business, it's not just the business. It's the byproduct of me and my life experiences and my co-founder and his life experiences and the values that we bring into this every day. And I will share what is not pictured on this is me on Monday night, literally two days ago, signing a set of contracts to sell my company. So LEAF, as of Monday, is officially acquired, which is just about the best exit that most entrepreneurs could ever hope for. So I officially uh, don't work for LEAF anymore. I have a new job as, as of yesterday, and uh, they were gracious enough to let me come and take the morning here. So I'm happy to share more on that and what that journey has been like, but it's been quite emotional. I uh, have not given birth before, but that's, that's the only thing I know to compare it to is there's just this mix of relief and gratitude and disbelief that just feels very overwhelming. But it's a, it's a great week. So I'm going to go into the leaf pitch. Now that you know a bit about me, I want to share what this looks like. Because if, if you're in business of any sort, you're going to be doing pitching um, whether it's your own business or an internal line of business for your company. And so thought I would share this. I've given this pitch approximately 8 million times. Um, but, but realistically, I've pitched this to well over 10,000 people. I mean, I, I don't know the exact number, but easily 10,000. So we'll go into this, and uh, there's always room for improvement. But imagine that you are forced to leave your country with only the things that you have in your wallet right now. And along that journey, you, uh, you've got your cash, your cards, your identity there. It's extremely risky, right? You think about the people in Ukraine this week who are being forced to leave their homes with only what they can carry. These are normal people. These are people like you and me that are just forced to flee without any, <laughs> any semblance of preparation. And this is the problem that we noticed at LEAF several years ago. We saw that all over the world, people were being forced to carry their valuables in cash. And when they leave their country, there's no great way to move their money with them. Now, I'll share that I've seen this play out on, on multiple levels. But when people come to the US, this is a problem. People that have had money in the past are used to being able to interact in normal society. Suddenly, they're poor. They can't bring their own assets with them. And they get stuck in the cycle of poverty. And they oftentimes end up making very poor decisions because life is extremely difficult. So we notice this problem. Carrying cash is dangerous. It's inconvenient. It's expensive to exchange. And so that's why we started LEAF. LEAF is a global virtual wallet, mostly for the unbanked, refugees, migrants, cross-border traders that can't get bank accounts. And with LEAF, they can store and transport their money across borders. It's a mix of savings, remittances, and payments. And the really cool thing is that it's blockchain-based, but it doesn't require a smartphone. We are very keen on not making people change their existing behavior patterns in order to use our product and taking the latest and greatest in technology and applying that to the people who usually receive that last. We noticed that this was also a significant business opportunity. This is not a charity. LEAF is not a nonprofit. It is a for-profit business because there are 180 million people facing displacement. On top of that, another 500 million people that rely on cross-border trade in Africa for income but don't have a great way to do that. And globally, there are still 2.4 billion people using smartphones or non-smartphones across the world, basic phones, you know, the little brick phones that you guys have probably, hopefully, never had. But we noticed that in that, there's a $42 billion annual market opportunity of money that is not being realized today. 
And so when we started looking at where to start with this, we saw that the global refugee crisis and displacement crisis affects about 180 million people. And within 60% of those conflict zones, there are already ways of getting money in and out of the physical and digital world that we could build on top of. And so we decided to focus on East Africa, where you've got a system called mobile money that makes our lives a lot easier. We can integrate with that. And you've got a, a high number, relatively high number, of displaced people and cross-border traders. You've already seen this. This is my official background, along with my co-founder, Nat Robinson. He started and ran a microfinance company in Kenya before LEAF, and he's also a lawyer in the US. And between the two of us, we saw that we had an interesting blend of financial services background and technology, and that we could hopefully pull this off. So we started it, and now we've got an 11-person team across the world. The way that LEAF actually works, it's a financial services platform you can use to store and transport your money, remember that, so that you create your account on a phone, and then you move money into your wallet through mobile money. That's the system that they use for payments in East Africa. It's kind of the equivalent of card payments here. You know, you swipe your card, somehow money moves from one place to another. That's what mobile money does in East Africa. So we're able to use that to get money into the LEAF wallet. And then once money is in LEAF, first of all, it's protected. And then the person is free to go about their, life as, their lives as they want. So they can send and receive with anyone on LEAF for free, kind of like Venmo. Venmo doesn't exist in East Africa. The current system is like if you had to pay 3 to 6% to pay somebody on Venmo instead of it being free. So LEAF provides that free functionality. You can also exchange into the currencies that we support. Um, and when you're ready to move that money out, you can send it to another mobile money account or you can buy airtime, do a number of things with it. So if you're actually physically crossing a border, it's very convenient, but also if you're just sending money to friends and family in other countries, that's very, very helpful for people because that did not exist before us. It is one global wallet that goes with the customer wherever they go, so it's not like you have to create separate LEAF accounts in multiple countries, but it's accessible with two front ends. So you can access it on a smartphone app, just like you and I would probably do, would be very comfortable with that, but you can also dial a short code on a basic phone and have this little menu pop up that gives you all the same options. So that's really nice for the customers that don't have smartphones. But even for those that do, we've seen that about 90% of our transactions come through that non-smartphone interface. So even for those that have smartphones, battery life can be a problem if you don't have electricity. Buying data is a problem. Uh, it's not like our phone plans in the US. And so this non-smartphone option is really helpful for people. And with that, you can store your money, send, receive, exchange, all of that. This is possible because of blockchain. I don't know how deep you all want to go into this. We can spend more time on it in the Q&A if you're interested. But basically, just know that there's a blockchain called Stellar that is behind the scenes that makes this very transparent and secure, but also doesn't complicate the user experience. So our users are transacting in Kenyan shilling tokens, Rwandan franc tokens. They don't need to see Bitcoin. There's nothing like that. We don't invest refugees' money in volatile cryptocurrency, uh, but it does make our lives a lot easier, and it allows us to do those cross-border transactions for basically free. This is really different than what exists in the market today, because we see that banks in East Africa, it's not really like our banks here, they're purely domestic. So it's very difficult to get your money out of the country. And then there's mobile money, which is kind of like the Venmo, but if it cost you 6% to send money. Um, and then there are new apps that are not available to the non-smartphone users. So we identified this niche, and so far we've kind of been the only one in it. But it's interesting because when we do this, that means we also have to explain a lot more to people uh, because we are creating something that is brand new. And many people have said, well, this isn't possible, but we've done it, so it is. So the one thing that we have kept really traditional is our business model. You'll hear me talk more about this later, but we, we know that there's a lot of technical risk in our product, a lot of market risk, and so the business model is very typical of a financial service application. We kind of combine the revenue model of a bank and a money transfer company. We're making money on the cash out fees when you take money out of the wallet in foreign exchange but then we don't have those high cost of a brick and mortar infrastructure because our, our operations are virtual. And so it allows us to do it in a much more cost efficient way. We'll skip over this, but everybody asks about compliance. Is this legal? Is it regulated? You all hopefully won't ask about that because it's a 20 minute conversation, but the answer is yes. And we partner with licensed entities. So this slide is outdated, but where we are now 
is we are in three countries, actually plus the UK as of last year, and we've done over 100,000 transactions. Our average transaction size is about $4, which I think is a big win because these are people that might only have $4, but we're able to help them move that where it needs to go and to store that, you know, if it was their last $4, it would be a very important $4. And so we've been able to, to provide services to people that would never be able to transact in those small amounts with the existing services available to them. We've got a loans product that is in development right now or is about to be deployed. And we're also working on a new product for people who don't have identity information because that's also a big problem in our markets. People don't have an ID. They don't have any form of proving who they are. And we can help with that. We recently have been very involved in the regulatory work in the US around blockchain and digital assets. Again, happy to talk more about that, but um, being, being highlighted to the US House Financial Service Committee was a big win for us as a successful live blockchain use case um, you know, of anybody in the world. We got to be highlighted, that was cool. And then as I mentioned, we've won lots of awards from lots of people. I want to, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there but I want to bring over a timeline just so you can see how this all happened. Again, we'll go with pictures because it's easier. You all can see this. Uh, this, you can see it's, it's a bit of a long journey. It feels like it's been a very long journey, but the idea was originated in 2016. 2017, we started pitching it. I got one of those giant checks uh, that you see on TV. Fun fact, you can fly with those. They do make you put it through the, um, the carry-on checker, yes, at the security checkpoint. Uh, but so we started pitching this in 2017, graduated in 2018, went full-time on it, did not have a developed product at that point. We had, we had a lot of market research, but if I could go back and change one thing, I would have just went heads down and, and started building earlier. We had a prototype and we did a closed beta in 2019. We went through the Techstars accelerator with that, um, but we didn't have something that we could launch in production. And so when COVID came around in 2020, we said, all right, this is it. We're going underground, we're rebuilding, built everything from the ground up with me and another developer and another, we'll say halftime developer and relaunched in September of 2020, we've been live since then. And through that, I've had, again, a lot of interesting experiences. But this is just to show Leaf from origination to acquisition has had a pretty short timeline comparatively. But it's not just that this happened in a year. This has been a long buildup. We've had a lot of help from a lot of different people along the way. So with that, I'm going to go back into this and just talk about some lessons learned. Some of these I've already mentioned in passing, some of these might not be applicable to you, but I'm in a reflective mood right now with everything with the acquisition. So this is what, this is what you're getting today. These might've been different if you had asked me a year ago or in a year from now. I mentioned I'm the unlikely entrepreneur. I never would have expected this for myself. I thought I was going to go into hospital operations, have a very safe career with HCA, be there for 30 years, live life, be very happy. That would have been a great life, but I got some curveballs and my life personally didn't work out the way that I thought, which kind of led to doing LEAF. And so I'm very thankful for that, but I also encourage people, you know, if you're not, if you're not the big ideas person, the visionary, that's fine. Entrepreneurship is changing and there's a place for everybody in entrepreneurship. I am very much the detail-oriented person who gets stuff done. And I didn't think that I could be an entrepreneur because of that, because of my personality and my working style. But I found that that's actually a really valuable skill set to have when there are lots of big dreamers around who aren't necessarily going to get it done. So I would say whatever your skills are, whatever your personality is, there is a place for you in entrepreneurship, even if you don't think of yourself that way. Know your why. This is extremely important. You will have to justify what you do every single day. You will talk to potential investors and partners and staff, and they want to know why you as a person are doing this. That's part of why I shared my story at the beginning, so that you know that this is, this is personal for me. I've walked this journey with people that matter to me, that I love dearly. There's an external why that you have to tell people every day, like how when I, when I started, I said, you know, I've, I've worked with resettled refugees in the US and I see how this leads to the cycle of poverty. That's true and it has to be true because people will sniff out that BS in a heartbeat if it's not. But there's also the internal why and that's what keeps you going day to day. So I know the people in my life that I do this for that matter to me, 
that's my external why that I can share with people and that is absolutely true. But I also have an internal why that is much more personal to me that keeps me going day to day when life is really hard and literal blood, sweat, and tears have gone into this. You've got to have that and you need to know it inside and out. At this point, there are no excuses for not using the tools in your life. It is amazing to see how just the different, different technologies and tool sets have come around in the last two to three years, especially because of COVID. So one specific thing that I would encourage all of you to do is use LinkedIn. It is not hard. You do not need to be technical. But once you get to 500 followers, it just says, or not followers, connections, it just says 500 plus connections. And it doesn't say, it's not like Facebook that says how many friends you have or Instagram that says how many followers you have. But somebody looking at your profile is much more likely to take you seriously if they see 500 plus connections. And usually people are pretty open on LinkedIn. So I would, not, I would never suggest spamming, but if you're able to research people and find people in your field that you think would be interesting to, to connect with, don't hit connect just by itself. Go to the send message or add note with it and just put something on there. I can't tell you how many literally hundreds of people have reached out to me in that way. And I'm happy to help. I'm happy to connect with people, um, to talk to them. And there's no excuse for not doing basic things like that at this point in your life when it could really benefit you professionally. Entrepreneurship is a constant trade-off. Uh, I'll, I'll go through these quickly, but basically at the beginning, I think of the startup landscape, People focused a lot on, you know, you have to chase after money. Don't forget to be talking to investors every single day and you have to get the money. There wasn't as much money around when, when people were giving that advice. Honestly, now I think the pendulum has swung to the other extreme where there's so much money flooding into the space that it's easy to get distracted by the different funding options. And so you can spend a lot of time working on how to get money to fund your business and forget that you actually have operations to run and that you need to have traction and proof that the business is going to succeed. And so I would say, you know, find, find your balance in that, but make sure that you're putting attention on both. But then with the caveat that you don't need to take all the money that's out there. There's, again, there's so much money coming from so many places. It is always important to get the right money for you. People that are going, that are going to support your vision, your business, you as a person, and not lead you astray. And then there's also this idea of novelty versus security. I didn't really know how to phrase this, but the, the example for me is that LEAF is really out there, right? Like it is different, it's blockchain, it's refugees, it's Africa, and people find that interesting, especially investors, because it's, it's not like anything they've seen. And people like novelty, but they don't wanna put all of their money into novelty. They wanna know that at the end of the day, they're going to get a reward for the risk that they're taking. And so finding that balance, like I said, our business model is very traditional, but we've got these other things that make it interesting for people. And I think that finding that in a business is very important. And then I'd say get comfortable with creative funding streams. You all have so many resources as students that you can capitalize on within a university setting. I have taken money from the Pope, the US government, um, <laughs> And, or, well, no, I'll leave that one out. Um, Cisco, United Nations, um, Techstars as, as an actual investment. I mean, I, I have exhausted the list of people to take money from. There's a lot of money out there. So you can find it if you're willing to get creative, especially within a university setting. I'd also say uh, Google sunk cost fallacy. If you haven't learned it in your classes yet, it's really important. And it's something that comes up every day in my life. As an entrepreneur, you want to say yes to so many things and then you get going down paths and you look behind you and there's this huge trail of work that you've done and you don't want to miss out on future opportunities and waste the work that's already been done and so you end up getting very distracted and that we just don't have time for that as entrepreneurs so i would say get comfortable with sunk cost fallacy basically even if you've put a lot of work into something if it's not the right thing cut it off don't look back and move forward put your resources elsewhere and then finally, just as general advice for you as students, get comfortable with data. There is no career outside of data and analytics at this point in the game. So even if you're not a data person, if you don't consider yourself a math person, that's fine. Get comfortable with data, get comfortable with Excel, get comfortable with basic analytics and logical concepts. And then finally, we get to what I would start today. Uh, I, I don't know that I would start LEAF today. It's not the right timing anymore. This is three years later, four years later. 
And truthfully, it's been really difficult. But I would say I, I do think that there are still significant opportunities in the cross-border space. So as the world becomes more international, we've seen this with COVID, it's still very difficult to move physical goods, data, and money across borders. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity in that space. So timing is a very, very big concept within entrepreneurship, but I think that there's still a lot of opportunity in that. So we're going to end the presentation there, but I do want to share before we go into Q&A, one really exciting thing that's going to come out of this today. Belmont has been generous enough to sponsor this event, and I thought it would be fun to put those funds towards something new that we're doing at LEAF, uh, which if you've heard anything about the recent NFT craze, we decided we're going to capitalize on that before the hype cycle dies down. So we have been coaching our refugee customers on how to create digital art. And basically all an NFT is, is digital art. It's a file, you know, you can make it, you can just take a photograph of a piece of art, and voila, you have an NFT. So we decided, why not do this? And we've been one of the first to pioneer the space of impact art, where the money that is, that is generated from those purchases doesn't go back to a charity or an organization, it's actually going directly back to the refugee artist. And so we've been able to facilitate listing these pieces on an exchange, and the refugees are getting paid, the money is coming through LEAF, that's how it's being delivered to them, and then they've got a global buyer's marketplace. Uh, and so it's been really fun, and it's life-changing money. Refugees get about $7 per person per month in UN funding, and we've been able to give refugees, or to pay refugees for the work that they've done, I mean, hundreds of dollars um, each. So this, this is outdated. But, uh, but I wanna show you, so the money that, Belmont is, sorry, um, the money that Belmont is sponsoring this event with is going to go towards purchasing these pieces. Uh, these are pieces that are done by 10 refugee customers of mine. And most of them were drawn as physical art and then we photographed and stylized them. Um, and it's part of a, a specific collection of pieces. So there are 30 pieces that are going to be purchased, the refugee artists are going to be paid, and then the pieces themselves are going to be donated back into a pot uh, so that if there are subsequent sales, that money is going to be used towards philanthropic efforts in Africa. So it's this virtuous cycle, double impact. I think it's very cool. I'm very thankful to Belmont and the refugee customers are going to be extremely excited about it. So if you wanna purchase any refugee art, feel free to check it out here, but just know that um, this, this event today is going to be making a big difference in the lives of a lot of people. Thank you all. Thanks for listening. What If is produced by Old Soul. For links and show notes, please visit belmontetp.com slash what if. Until next time, keep asking what if. Oh,